All right, good morning and uh, and and welcome to the uh, third and final day of our Geo for Live Camp Unconference. Uh, we, of course, have two more days of working sessions, but this will be the final day for the actual conference uh, portion of the week. And this morning, uh, we have a keynote speaker, of course, as always. Um, Bryn Kramer began working as assistant cataloger at the David Rumsey Map Center in 2018, aiding in the accessioning and cataloging of thousands of maps and assisting with conferences and exhibits held at the DRMC. Before coming to Stanford, Bryn was a library at the San Francisco Public Library and a volunteer at the San Francisco Maritime National Historic Park Research Center. Bryn is currently the Cartographic Project Metadata Librarian at the Branner Map Collection at Branner Earth Sciences Library, where she works on the Conrad Collection on Dutch waterways. This collection documents through maps and technical il illustrations the construction of the Dutch coastal and waterway infrastructure from the 17th to the 20th centuries. Within this role, she is responsible for cataloging, organizing, and managing the digitization process of the collection. This forgotten Stanford collection is the subject of her keynote talk this morning. Please join me in welcoming Bren Kramer. Uh, thank you very much, Stacey. I appreciate that. That was wonderful. Uh, so, good morning. Uh, as Stacey said, my name is Bryn Kramer, and I am the cataloger and project manager for the Conrad Collection on Dutch Waterways. This is a two-year project uh, with the goal of cataloging and digitizing a collection which has remained hidden within Stanford Library for uh, about 116 years. Working on digitizing the materials are Peter Crandall and Wayne Vanderkill, with the cataloging being done by myself and Megan K. Trott, who has since left the project, although she is very much missed. Before I get started, I wanted to briefly outline what I will cover today. First, I will consider the history of the collection, as well as give a brief overview of the Conrad family. Following this is the meat of my presentation, where we will explore the cataloging and workflows implemented to better enable access. Finally, will be the concluding thoughts and hopefully answering any questions that might arise. Throughout, I will explore some of the amazing maps and stories we discovered along the way. One caveat before I begin, uh, we will be looking at several maps from the collection today, not surprising. Uh, when creating this presentation, I ended up abbreviating a number of the titles as they were extremely long. In one of my run-throughs, we ended up with a wall of text and little tiny maps. <laughs> so we re-inverted that slightly. To best uh, to appreciate the scope of the material, it is helpful to understand them. The Conrad Collection is the Dutch, and the uh, Conrad Collection on Dutch Waterways represents not a single man's legacy, but rather that of an entire family of engineers. We have copper engravings, uh, lithographs, blueprints, manuscripts, uh, meaning hand drawn in this case. They date from roughly the 1600s all the way to 1902 running the gamut of maps, engineering drawings, uh, calendars, correspondence, and even doodles. Uh, the latter maybe being my least favorite to catalog. I don't know if you've ever tried to catalog a doodle, but it's awful. <laughs> uh, so far in the project, we have found that most of the materials are related to the Netherlands, especially in the provinces of North Holland, uh, South Holland, Zealand, and Gelderland. But uh, Belgium, Egypt, Germany, and many other countries are represented and should not be forgotten. Language like geographic coverage is wide ranging. Uh, while many are in Dutch, we also have them in English, German, Latin, Spanish, and French. When we began our work, not a great deal was known about the acquisition of the collection uh, by Stanford University. Along with JFW Conrad's personal catalog, uh, we have a letter uh, dated June 10th from 1903 from the bookseller Martinez Nikov. In this, he outlines the transfer of a second shipment of materials belonging to the collection. What the first one consisted of, we're not sure. We can only assume that from the original catalog that we have and what we have here on campus. Due to correspondence with the institutions in the Netherlands, we know that Stanford did not acquire the entire library, with a portion remaining behind. In addition, during the course of our work, I ran across this amazing article 
by a colleague of Conrad's, where he notes that while the library was purchased by Leland, uh, by Stanford Leland University, the Royal Institute of Engineers ended up with many choice selections before they were shipped. With Stanford's acquisition of the collection in 1903, the materials were placed in the Hawkins Transportation Library, which is over in Pacific Grove near Monterey. At some point, they were transferred to the campus near Palo Alto, where they remained locked away until 2021, where the beginnings of this project. One helpful aspect is that while we are currently cataloging the assorted materials stored in map drawers, there were, uh, these actually represent only a portion of the collection. At an earlier date, some 1,200 books and pamphlets were cataloged by special collections. And this is important. It thus permits us to access that information during our research phase. And they have proven absolutely invaluable. As I mentioned earlier, the Conrad Collection represents not a single family's legacy, but rather that of an entire family of engineers. While there were many members actively working in the engineering field, I'm going to be generous and only touch on three of the most frequently surfaced that most frequently surfaced in the collection. First is Frederick W. Conrad. He was the grandfather of JFW Conrad. He was born in Delft, 1769, uh, orphaned at a young age. He completed his education and began working as a hydraulic engineer. Uh, during the course of the work, he uh, his work career, he worked with such people as Christian Brings and General Kranoff. Working his way up, he eventually made it to Dutch Inspector General. This, however, was short-lived, and within one year, he died of scarlet fever. During his life, he was active in engineering projects and mapping across the Netherlands, along with publishing many writings and reports. Uh, this is an example of his work that can be found. Uh, this manuscript map is part of a published series that he created related specifically to a dike breakthrough that occurred in 1795 at school near Kuhlenberg. Documentations of the dike's breaking occurs throughout the collection um, and is worth noting. It has become a very handled tool for determining the age of a situation if the cartographer has left that out. And that happens quite frequently. After Senior's death, all three of his sons were educated and entered into the same profession. <laughs> Frederick W. Conrad, we'll call him Junior, not to get confused, is the next family member I will touch on. He is the uncle of JFW Conrad and worked as a hydraulic engineer and a railway engineer, being well known uh, for assisting with the early adoption of the railway in the Netherlands. Along with publishing his writings, uh, being a co-founder of the Royal Institute for Engineers, president of one of the first telegraph companies uh, and other fascinating work. I don't want to forget to mention uh, his work related to the Suez Canal. It was on a return trip from here that he died in 1870. One of my favorite stories from the collection comes from Conrad's time working on the Holland Iron Railway Company. He was in the process of laying down a railway between Amsterdam and Rotterdam in the 1840s. Uh, near the city of Delft, he ran across a small issue where the landowner refused to sell the land, uh, apparently wishing for a far more money than the railway company was willing to, sell, to give. This went on for several years. Eventually, Conrad simply worked around the problem. And you can see here where he simply moved the train track around the house. <laughs> Uh, the railway line did open for business. They did test it to make sure that it was safe beforehand. And the family did go ahead and give the land free of charge and the railway was uh, straightened up soon after that. <laughs> Finally, there is J.F.W. Conrad, whose library we are looking at today. Like his predecessor, he was a Dutch engineer and he worked as chief inspector, politician, and like his uncle, served on a committee for the Suez Canal. Honestly, the litany of his work would keep us here all day. Unsurprisingly, his hand is found in many of the maps and reports within the collection. One of the earlier projects that he is known for is his construction of the Willem III Lock in North, uh, on the North Holland Canal near Amsterdam. This sheet shows the current Willem lock with the proposed Willem III overlaid, um, although it wouldn't officially be named such till several years later. 
after several years uh, work, it was completed in 1864. Many of the materials from the collections are proposed plans such as this, and it's interesting tracking and discovering the state of the work. Sometimes the works, the, the products were completed, other times they just disappear into history. When we started this project, we essentially had 20 to 30 drawers of materials needing to be cataloged, with the occasional atlas and pamphlet thrown in for fun. Uh, there were maps without titles and dates, maps missing sheets, different states of maps, engineering drawings, map drafts, and letters all mixed together. Having remained uh, locked away for 116 years after being shipped from The Hague to California. With the goal of completing this project in two years, we needed to create workflows that would enable us to organize and work our way through the collection, eventually permitting researchers to access the data locked away within the materials. Thinking back on the experience today, there are three takeaways that I will touch on. First is documentation. Sec is second is finding the map, i.e. location. And third is conservation and digitization. One of our first challenges while approaching this project was the lack of documentation. Little was known about the early materials beyond the immediate provenance. Uh, early assessments of the collection showed the materials to be somewhat wide ranging and eclectic. In addition, during the assessment, early participants on the project found that many of the materials were uncatalogued in WorldCat. And among those that were, many of the records were in a language other than English. The current practice is to find a map record created by another institution and adapt it to the specific map in front of you. For example, I might copy a catalog record for this map, but would add a note about the hand coloring and the fact that it is part of the Conrad collection. However, a large portion of the collection had no such records in WorldCat. As such, we would need to originally catalog them a time-consuming process of originally generating fresh metadata for each map. Additionally, there were other challenges. As you know, a controlled uh, authority name is vital for tracking down all the materials accredited to a specific creator. On older materials, uh, spellings of names change frequently or possibly only honorifics are listed. Take, for example, this map. It was published by the widow of Nicholas Fisher. Not a proper name I want to use for access. Thankfully, the Library of Congress already has an authorized term, Elizabeth Russell for Purcell. However, many of the surveyors and cartographers within the collection are less well known and have so no such authorized terms. Finally, with multiple people working on the collection, there always runs the risk of researching the same topic, spending time looking for information when a solution has already been found. There are many rabbit holes uh, in historical research, and it's important to choose wisely. <laughs> This led to one of our firm and fast rules, document everything. To catalog this collection, we needed to create our own personal controlled vocabulary for many of the cartographers. This meant tracking down each iteration of the name we found and selecting a single name to uh, function as an access point. So it's not always an easy process and new information is always being gleaned. As we progressed through the collection, we often had to remediate what came before. Uh, sometimes we would start with one cartographer, only to find out down the road that he had a son by exactly the same name. <laughs> yeah, and that happened multiple times. Uh, to track all of this, we used a prodigious number of spreadsheets. They had the advantage of being easily accessible by a large number of people. Throughout the project, documenting all the information ensured we had clear lines of communication. Uh, this was vital in a project such as this. Megan and I carefully tracked and explained where information came from, listed research sources, wrote explanations to common dates. The list goes on and would terrify the most data-loving individual. The careful documentation we demanded was not limited to just the spreadsheets. Uh, some of the materials are undated, as I mentioned, and require research to, uh, to estimate a date. And this can be challenging and have no clear answer. In the end, a map with a railway may just have a note saying date estimated because of uh, the introduction of railways into the Netherlands. But we carefully document that so the researcher coming will understand where that date was retrieved from. By creating a shared vocabulary, we ensured consistency throughout the collection, no matter the cataloger. 
memory is a weak thing. We need such tools. It's difficult to remember six months, let alone a year later. Yes, we occasionally still lost ourselves in historical research. There is no cure for that. But it is it, we limited the duplication of work and more seamlessly shared the results. Research in Serum proved to be one of our the favorite aspects of this project, and we often found interesting connections between the maps. While cataloging this map, we soon realized this is but one of several maps in the collection that describe the shoreline erosion in one small town. The map you are looking at is hand drawn, showing the town in 1719. Thanks to the key in the lower right, we know the location of the local school, town hall, various streets, and other points of interest. Of specific note on this map is the church tower. Uh, it's the church and the church tower, which are in danger from the beach erosion, despite ongoing attempts to slow it. If we focus in on the inside in the upper right, we can see that in 1686, the town extended much further out. In fact, buildings and other streets existed there. From images I have seen while researching, it was a gorgeous church. And I'm sure you can see the writing on the wall and this particular story doesn't end well. Uh, a few years later after this map, a massive storm swept through and destroyed the church and surrounding buildings. However, the story of the church did not disappear. 150 years later, we still find the information, they are, the situation being tracked. Uh, the two views here are from the 1719 map that we just looked at, with the current situation noted on the left. Uh, even today, if you look the town up on Wikipedia, the story of the church is one of the first things you see. I'm fascinated in how this story has remained alive throughout all of the years. We faced several challenges that ultimately came down to understanding the geographic location of the materials. First, one of our final goals for this project is to upload the images into Earthworks, Stanford's online search tool for geographical data. As such, we need to give accurate coordinates and locations to each map. Some maps we can do easily. However, it proved far more challenging when the materials referred to situations that no longer existed. For example, a bridge that was destroyed an island reclaimed by the ocean, or a river that changed course. One of our most powerful tools, however, were the very maps we were cataloging. Many of them had the information we need. A moving bridge from 1845 on the outskirts of a city won't appear on today's Bra maps. But an 1856 survey of the local province, there we might find it. We just needed to access the data. A slight challenge when we are in the process of cataloging ongoing. Our second problem was that many of the maps consisted of multiple sheets, sometimes two, three, or even 36. However, during the course of the collection's long history, we discovered that some of these sheets have been separated. The title sheet is easy to figure out, but how do you connect a half sheet lost, lost amongst a thousand others? We did have one benefit, however. We felt confident that complete sets of maps should exist within the collection. Meh, this only true, proved half true. While we have been able to connect some of the lost siblings, others remain orphaned. Whether this is because we never received them in the original 1903 shipment, uh, or if they are squirreled away in some room on campus, I don't know. I suspect we never received them, but in my heart of hearts, I would really love the idea of them being on Stanford. <laughs> the solution to both these problems came down to research and access. As I mentioned earlier, special collections at Stanford cataloged many of the books and pamphlets belonging to Conrad. This proved very useful as we often discovered maps and drawings were either taken from the books or referenced by them. With hindsight, this is hardly surprising as taken together, they represent an entire library. Once the maps or drawings are linked to a specific book, it becomes much easier to determine specific locations, assign dates, or even determine authors. Additionally, I must mention that the archives and universities in the Netherlands proves invaluable. But the ultimate question came down to is how do we access the information locked away in the very maps we're working on? There are thousands of them. Searching every one is not possible. Our solution was to try and assign province level subject terms to the initial records. The cataloging process we used was to create a basic stub record for the title, date, et cetera, if it could be easily determined. 
uh, discovering specific locations, complicated author questions and scale calculations uh, is more complicated and would be done on a second pass. However, it was often possible to determine the general location relatively quickly. A specific river mentioned, a town in the distance. As such, we tried to add the name of the province to the record. This had two benefits. First, if we needed to track down some historic information on a breakthrough of a dike on the river of the Rhine, we could just limit to, say, Gelderland. This proved useful. Rather than needing to view every map of the Rhine within the collection, a terrifying number, uh, we limited the results. Once we were able to confirm the historical locations of a breakthrough, a bridge, or a, or a building, we are able to assign geographic coordinates, and it becomes much more simple. And access to the material opens up. Second, we're able to use the provenance, the province level terms to reconnect sheets that have been separated. It's not possible to view every map and pattern recognize missing sheets. My memory is just not that good. However, limiting the results to those within a particular province proved manageable. Sheets could be tracked down and geographic coordinates assigned. Province level terms are not generally added to smaller uh, locations as there's a problem with this. When searching a map of the province of Zealand, most researchers don't want to retrieve every city, polder, and river map within the location. And we will very likely remove these terms at the project's conclusion. However, during the cataloging process, they enabled us to break the materials down into manageable chunks and proved invaluable. So as I'm sure you've noted, tracking historic changes to topography is a theme throughout the Conrad collection. J.F.W. Conrad himself was meticulous at studying and copying historical maps, uh, which have been a powerful tool in our research and equally frustrating at times. It's not always easy to determine if the hand-drawn map you're cataloging is an original or a facsimile. This is a map that he created sometime after around 1866. It shows Den Helder, which is in the province of North Holland and the surrounding area. I admit at first it's not much to look at, but bear with me. Within the title, we discover that the images in red are showing the topography of 1571 and 1702. And he retrieved this from a specific map that he notes up there. This data then is overlaid on a survey from 1866, printed in black. History has been layered and peeled back for us by Conrad in a single map. One of the details that I particularly enjoy this map on this map is the changes are reflected in the technology as well. In the upper right, we have an older sailing ship in red ink, and this is juxtaposed with steamships printed in black ink. Technology is ever advancing. I mentioned that Conrad will often copy older maps, and here we have an example of Den Helder. I can credit Conrad with being the copyist because he kindly informs us of this in the lower right of the map. Uh, many times the producer of a facsimile will cite their name. However, just as often they don't. Conrad then took this historic map and overlaid it on the survey, probably something similar to this. Within the collection, I located a copy of the survey map uh, and then layered Conrad's facsimile uh, with the opacity pulled back. Conrad's map always reminds me of the most, some of the modern tools we use. Geo-referencing historical maps on Google Earth and then pulling back the opacity to track changes over time. The layering of history is a theme that comes up throughout the collection and by many different cartographers. However, with Conrad's map, we're able to see the process in action. One of the other major hurdles we faced was the fragility of the materials. They spent 116 years in the years stored away in map drawers on campus. Before that, they were shipped from Europe and it's difficult to say the wear and tear they suffered during their life in the Netherlands. However, Working on the collection meant we constantly needed to compare and confirm topographic changes throughout the collection. Additionally, this project was attempting to pull the entire collection together into a single organized unit, which again, it means handling the materials and working with them. How do we balance the need to preserve the materials versus access them? Two avenues we chose. First, we contacted and worked closely with conservation department. They've been amazing in helping us to safely work with the materials, uh, repairing items when needed, suggesting safe, safe storage um, uh, options, answering every possible random question that I might have on the history of paper, watermarks, et cetera. 
Second, we digitized the materials before they were completely cataloged. In general, when a map is received, the cataloging uh, librarian creates a record and fully catalogs the map with all relevant data. Then it is sent to the scanning lab where it is digitized and the image attached to the record. Once completed, the map is then returned to the library and shelves. However, we turned that process on its head for two reasons. One, we had a scanning team ready and prepared at the project's inception. Two, we ultimately decided that it was better for the materials if we worked up high quality digitized scans of the maps rather than the original themselves. For example, this map that you see here is on tracing paper is incredibly fragile and working with it was a challenge. As such, the scanning began as soon as the basic stub records were uh, created. Importantly, this gave us access to the scanned images far more quickly than otherwise and enabled us to safely study the materials without further damaging them uh, through retrieval. It's not a perfect solution, and sometimes we still need the original, but it helped a great deal. Having access to the digitized material better enabled us to research and make connections, especially with the older materials that we didn't want to handle. In all things, data is key. Hands down, one of the more intriguing tales we researched while working on the collection is the draining of the Harlem Mare, also known as the Sea of Harlem or the Water Wolf. The Harlem Mermer is a large body of water in North Holland. Uh, it rested between Leiden, Harlem, and Amsterdam. No, I got that wrong, sorry. Uh, it lives large within the writings and maps of the time. Uh, it's hard to underscore what you see when you do the researching on it. There were battles that were fought on it. There were massive storms, shipping. It's absolutely incredible to see and read about. Over the years, it, the, the, the lake grew from a small collection of three lakes to a large body of water that set, threatened the local cities. This published map by Bolstra is hand-colored engraving published in the 1740s. Like Conrad's map a century later, the map was created from studying older maps describing the changes in topography. If we take a close look at this corner in the north, we can appreciate the care he put into the map. Here we can see the detail of the fishermen on their ship, as well as the lines carefully documenting and dating the, chain, the shoreline changes. I especially want to note this village here. This is one of several villages on the map that are noted as being forsaken or abandoned over the course of the lake's history. And it's a striking reminder that the water wolf was an ever-present danger that took people's lives and property. We were delighted to discover that within the collection, we have a uh, vellum uh, map from the 1680s uh, that is actually connected to the Harlem Romero. And I apologize for less than stellar imagery. This map just came back from conservation <laughs> Monday. On this survey map, you could see the village that we just looked at at Bolster's map. And it has actually mostly been taken over by the lake. If this were to extend maybe you know, a couple of years forward, you would see the village going much further out. Bolstra's map traces the history of the lake. As with Conrad's map in Den Helder, Bolstra has peeled back time. To better show the transformation, the copy I originally showed was hand colored. Without the color, it can be difficult to see the changes uh, as seen in this copy here. Thanks to modern technology, we also can transform and interact with the materials. These sheets that you see here are from a project by my colleague, Megan Trott. Uh, she georeferenced Bolstra's map in QGIS and then created shape files by tracing the shoreline from each year, transforming the information from a paper map into vector data. Extracting the information allowed her to better demonstrate to a modern audience how dangerous this waterway was. And why stop there? Uh, one of the uh, once the images are completed, it's a simple thing to create a GIF. Megan's, pro Megan's project shows how dangerous the water wolf really was, and there were many plans like this to dike and drain the lake. Uh, in this example, it's hard to appreciate how massive it was, and all of these circles show you many different windmills that would have been along the border in order to accomplish this. Close-ups of the map show us the details that might not be visible on the screen, and I absolutely adore those windows. <laughs>
uh, one thing about this collection, I'm now windmill crazy and spend most of my time trying to find them on maps. <laughs> ah, that's scary. Um, ships are ready to sail, sail out to sea. Despite the Valium plant, it would be over 100 years later and through the use of three pumping stations powered by steam mills that the impossible would be accomplished and the land was reclaimed and sold. Today, it looks no different than any other. The dark history hidden under the land. No. Yep. <laughs> I will return to my first question I asked this morning. How would I describe the collection? It is the personal library of a Dutch engineer. But that dry statement of fact does not do justice to the stories of transformation, change, and human ingenuity that we find within. As a cataloger, the question I always struggle with is accessibility of the materials. I am unable to uh, conclude today without showing two of my favorite maps in the collection. Uh, this absolutely stunning manuscript map is a survey from the 1800s and shows the River Isol, parts of the Rhine, and Vol. It is 32 sheets, and it's as large as you think it is. In fact, it's bigger than this screen. Uh, it's absolutely incredible in its detail. Cities, towns, houses uh, with gardens that I want to desperately walk in every time I view them. While this map is beautiful, beautiful, a great deal of the data is inaccessible. I recognize that the record I create cannot list every town, city, windmill, or building on this map. If a researcher were investigating property ownership and were interested in local history surrounding the House of Women in Germany, which is right along the border of Netherlands, a search query within the Conrad collection would find only three results, one of which you see here. And a close up of the house, mostly because I think it's charming. <laughs> However, the hypothetical research would be missing a wealth of data if they limit themselves to just those three maps that they discovered. If we come back to this, House Bimmet is visible. If one can find it, I'll give you a hint, but it's still difficult to see until you get close. <laughs> Very close. One possible solution I see is the machines reading maps technology. It's been discussed a great deal recently, and I'm intrigued by the idea of using it to extract information to better access the collection. I see the technology as a powerful aid to both catalogers and researchers. How many mysteries would we have been, have been easily solved if we've been able to use this as another tool within the cataloging process? Stories are hidden away within the maps. The question is, can we retrieve them? Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, sorry. Can you go back to the map that had the red and the black in it? Yes. Um, I thought you were going to say, I, when you were talking about the change in technology, I thought you were going to say something a little bit different. And I was sitting here giggling because it looks to me, you mentioned really that, that one. Uh -huh. you, uh, you mentioned uh, really early on that there were both uh, you know, a lot of the, uh, etchings as well as lithographs. Mm -hmm. Is the red a lithograph and the black an etching? Because right. when you showed the close-up of the boat, that looks like that looks like crayon rather than an etching. To me. Yeah, I believe they're actually both lithographs. They're both lithographs. Yes, okay. because uh, if you look at... You crayon on the black as well. Yeah, so... So yeah, I thought you were going to make a joke about the changing printing technology as well. I had to leave all of my printing technology out. You have no idea how oh, hard it was not to tell that story. It's the geographic part. Like, I, I, you must have been like a, like a pig in a sty with the printing paper too. Yes, it was amazing. <laughs> it was yeah, terrifying. Yeah, uh, and we have everything. I mean, I touched upon this, but we will have, he kept everything. And so if we go back to the, hold on. Um, so this particular sheet is one of five that we have in our collection. Each of them are a different early print. Oh, wow. And I believe that all of them are prior to when it was officially printed because I can find other copies and none of them match unless he just never matched any of his, so which is possible. Like I think maybe they're like practicing with lithography because it was, it was like stone lithography was a 
it, contemporary. Justice. It was, it definitely was. I think at this point, it was just, I th no, I think these, these ones were final ones that were actually printed because I found enough copies of them out there, but I definitely see them where they were practicing and deciding how it would look. Um, I don't have the link here because in one of them you see, sorry. The shoreline here, yeah. I have another one where that's duplicated. So you can see they were testing to see what it would look at like when they were lining up the stone. Yeah, yeah. and so yeah. you could see the difference, like two or three of them all lined up on this. That in and of itself is a talk. This is amazing. Yeah. Yeah, and that doesn't even include the engravings where we'll have, we have copies of the engravings where we can clearly see spelling changes that were made, and then we have other prints that follow that, and they keep going through. Yeah. It's neat to see, they, were, they didn't red pen. It never changes. A quick comment on this. This is, when we first saw the collection, this is the, the printing technology stuff was uh, one, one of the things that I thought was the most interesting about it, and this series of maps in particular is one because I think there's such a, is this one of the larger things that like the same map in different versions, right? I think, um, I think what's important to know about the collection is you can't, you can't get unless you go and really just like thumb through all of this stuff. Um, and, and all the, all, all the, like there were no like um, uh, architectural drawings, right? Like there's all these engineering drawings of like what's going on here. So the thing to remember is, um, these were these were not collections of maps for a library, even a personal library. These were an engineer's uh, like an engineering firm working with mm -hmm. yeah. And so a lot of these are things that go in the field. So many of them are are hand scribed for their duplicates because they are making their field documents. They're taking the field or they're working somewhere with field notes and they're animating yeah. it in real life. And then they have yeah. another version that has. But all else, yeah. the notation, maybe they made 10 or 20. Exactly. So mm -hmm. the field, that's yeah. a big part of why you see some of these things over and over, over again, but like slightly different. Mm -hmm. And it's there, there are some also, you know, slightly different, but also early survey maps. And so we have copies of the manuscript survey maps that they would send in. And then we have copies of the copper engravings that they would make off of this. Um, and they're absolutely stunning and beautiful. There was a question from online, but it was just about where can we find, is there a, a link within search words where we can find all of these maps? And I put the, the Conrad collection. Thank you. Um, this is just wonderful. I just want to say that this is one of the best examples of what's possible with collections like this that mm -hmm. I've seen. From your pulling out these anecdotes about, you know, battling nature, uh, to the the digitization and vectorization, and then ultimately the animation mm -hmm. of of the dynamics. Um, this is a, an excellent example of why this is our best chance at really long term longitudinal data sets on climate change mm -hmm. and human interaction with the environment. And this is why these collections are so important yeah. to surface and catalog effectively. Yeah. I'm very excited to start seeing more collections like this. Even as we were working on this, there were the archives in the Netherlands were digitizing and scanning more of their materials. So we were able to make connections that we wouldn't necessarily in the beginning. And again, I talk about remediation. Oh, look, we found this now. Perfect. I can give this a date. Uh, and it's just an amazingly powerful tool as we all allow this information to be accessed. Can you talk a little more about, it? has there been any more ongoing uh, collaboration or communication with the, with the colleagues in the Netherlands where, the, where other parts of the, the original collection are, are living? No, we are hoping to do that soon. We were waiting until we had enough bulk of the material scanned before we started the collect discussions on that. Yeah, I think that's really important. I think I, I think this, I mean, I don't know what the state of their digitization of that part of the collection is, but this, if they haven't begun the work, yeah. is a perfect motivation for doing that. Yeah, and you can definitely find um I see. So a lot of the work that we have is like, say, uh, so the work that was done there, and you can find a vast number of scans of uh, similar materials over there as well. Some of it we can actually link to, you know, work that Conrad is doing and stuff like that. For Conrad's actual personal archive, I haven't seen anything about that being publicly available yet, uh, but I do know that it's over there. Like having to do more with his documents and research. I think this would be a great, I mean, just this talk in and of itself 
would be a great tool to break that ice with those, mm -hmm. those other collections. It's, yeah, the, the, the engineering projects that we see over there are just amazing. Uh, and it just teaches you, teaches you to really respect the work that is done. Um, I, yeah. I'm just curious how much Dutch you learned. <laughs> I know the important words are like Dorbrakana. <laughs> Breakthrough. Let's go. Yes, that's what I want. Uh, enough to recognize that I don't know what, you know, that I can just sort of get a rough feel for what's happening. Um, I'm still not as good as I want to be, and I'm still working on that as well. I love the story of the town. The wolf. Oh, the water wolf. Yes. The water wolf. Yeah. Um, that got eaten. Yes. But then when they filled back in, when they reclaimed the land, the town that i do not know um so this would have been uh, this was a map of it soon afterwards do not oh wait I have, have to look that up and see. I didn't, I actually stopped historically. I'm like, oh, look, it sank and that's it. Uh, but <laughs> uh, that would be absolutely fascinating to find out. I don't know, that is a very good question. And now you have given me a new research to go do. <laughs> that is very dangerous. Well, it seems like your collection, because there's so much Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. That would be absolutely fascinating. Yeah. That would be absolutely fascinating. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Oh, sorry. I added that at last minute, so I got to keep going. Ah, there it is. Yep. Finish the. No, you didn't talk about this, but you noticed there's a bunch of hand extensions of property from the existing shoreline back into the, what the lake, right? It doesn't have that much, but like a lot of material happens kind of stuff on it. Where yeah. That's just what, that's like under, either underwater, you know, what was taken or what maybe will be there once uh, that area is the drain. The, thinking across that boundary. Yeah. Part. Yeah, that would be interesting. And plus, I mean, a lot of these maps are survey maps, so they also track uh, property ownership. And we can go back for years on that one. And, you know, again, because well, that's what I was talking about with House Bidman, is that there's no way to track that property ownership on the maps. That particular house comes on so many of our maps, because that's just a really uh, important, hold on. I'm gonna go back to there, sorry, that close up. This particular area is really important. Uh, especially when they went ahead and opened up to shipping here. Uh, they'll have them and appears on so many of our maps. And in fact, it got to the point where we would start to look for it. <laughs> like, oh, there it is. <laughs> uh, so, um, but that information's never pulled out in any of the maps. If some other researcher was to come look at the same area, there's, you know, how would they know to access it? How would they know how important it is that it appears on so many of these maps when even on other maps where they leave off property, we will find that particular house mentioned. It's interesting. Yeah. Um, it was probably before you started on the project, but you mentioned that they were, you know, it was forgotten out in Monterey Bay, like, or in Monterey. Like, like do, you, do you know, like, who's the person who opened the drawer and found the collection? I that's probably in an email somewhere. <laughs> I know that they had a librarian over there who went through, and that was when they took care of, of cataloging, I believe. That, my understanding is that when they cataloged the books at the same time, they shipped the maps over here. But um, I don't know the specifics of it. Okay. Yeah. That would be a whole other interesting story. It is a fascinating story. Oh, yeah.